Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar, Programming with MATLAB. My name is Jiro Doke, and I'm an application engineer at MathWorks. Today I have three main objectives. First, I'd like to introduce you to MATLAB from the lens of a programming language. Now, MATLAB is oftentimes thought of as a technical tool for engineers and scientists uh, to do uh, data analysis, simulations, uh, or develop algorithms. But MATLAB is also a uh, full-fledged programming language, and I'd like to highlight some of those capabilities. Also, I'd like to introduce you to the various development tools that's built around it to support the MATLAB language. I'll go through a couple of examples, and through those examples, I'd like to demonstrate how you can program effectively in MATLAB. And also show you the various programming styles that MATLAB supports, uh, ranging from interactive programming all the way up to uh, using more formal techniques such as object-oriented programming. So let's get into the example. Uh, the example we're going to use today is uh, on creating an automated analysis routine using MATLAB to choose the best location to build a wind turbine based on some of the measurement data that we have acquired from multiple locations. So this is from the wind energy industry. As you can see in the picture, this, these wind turbines are pretty large and very expensive to build. So what they do is before they build one of these uh, wind turbines or wind farms, they need to first find the best location, ideal location to build them. So they do that by taking measurements at these various sites, by measuring uh, wind speed and temperature and so forth. And based on that information, they can try to estimate how much power they would be able to generate if they were to build a wind turbine at that location. So what we want to do is develop a program that would analyze, read in those multiple files, do those calculations, and then identify what the best location is. So the way they calculate the average power production is based on this formula here. And it's essentially based on these two quantities, the wind speed probability distribution, which we can get from the measurements, and also this curve, uh, which we call the turbine power curve, uh, which is uh, something that characterizes the wind turbine that they're going to build. But based on these quantities, they can multiply them and integrate over it uh, to calculate what the average power is going to be. Okay, but um, we'll come back to this slide when we get to that section of the uh, example, but keep this idea in the back of your head as we go through the, the example. Okay, so let's uh, switch over to MATLAB. This is the MATLAB desktop. It's uh, uh, an interactive uh, development environment, IDE, with various components really help you use MATLAB and also develop programs. Um, we have this tool strip with uh, many of the controls that you oftentimes uh, need to do your analysis in MATLAB, and it's really designed to allow you to find the functionalities that you really need for your, for your work inside MATLAB. And we'll introduce uh, the various components as they come up in the example, but if we take a look at um, these various tools, especially in the early phases in your programming, it's very important to make use of these interactive tools because you, you need that way of a, a mechanism for exploring ideas. Uh, so this interactively interactivity becomes really important. So in this current folder, uh, you can see a lot of different files. Here's the file that we're going to be working with, WinData.txt. Uh, that's a text file, ASCII file. And if we take a look at what it looks like, it's a uh, columns of data. Uh, five columns of information. The first column is the timestamp with the uh, various hours that we've measured. And it's an hourly data from starting from 10th of June 2007 all the way down to 10th of June 2008. So it's one year's worth of data, uh, roughly 8,700 data points. Okay. And for each hour, we have three speed wind speed measurements and measured in meters per second. So these are three redundant measurements, uh, three sensors at the same location to make sure, sort of validate each of the, the measurements. And then there's a temperature sensor at that site to measure the air temperature, the ambient temperature in Celsius. Okay. So the idea is to develop a MATLAB program that would automatically read in this, do the analysis, and then ultimately calculate the the uh, estimated average power so that we can determine which uh, location is the best. Okay, so to help me create uh, this program, I'm going to be uh, initially relying a lot of the uh, on a lot of the uh, interactive tools that's built into into MATLAB Desktop. 
um, to, to import the data, I'm going to use this import data control right in the home tab. And here um, we can select uh, the file that we want to import. And it's going to display that in the uh, this interactive import tool. Okay, so what we see here is um, uh, the the preview of the, of the the data inside this file, and it um, automatically determines what the header is, and it's it's going to use those names as the uh, data that's coming into MATLAB. You can do some quick pre-processing, for instance, uh, if I want to. Uh, convert these textual representation representation of dates into numerical representation uh, or serial dates. We can do that by specifying the date format. Um, we can have uh, full control of how we might want to bring into MATLAB. But then once we click on this checkbox, uh, MATLAB will scan through the file and it's going to automatically import those uh, data points into MATLAB as, uh, in this case, five different variables. Five different pieces of data uh, corresponding to each column. Okay, uh, It brings it into the MATLAB workspace, which you can think of it as MATLAB's memory space. Every piece of information that MATLAB knows about will be uh, um, shown in the MATLAB workspace browser. Okay, So as you can see, we were able to easily bring in the data from the data file. But at the end of the day, we would like to programmatically do this so that we can apply this to multiple data files. Well, if we go back to the import tool, we can ask MATLAB to generate a script, uh, which will essentially uh, give you the sequence of MATLAB commands to reproduce this process, um, this action. So you can see that it had just auto-generated this uh, MATLAB script, which has sequence of MATLAB commands. So these are all MATLAB commands uh, to do the same thing that I've done through the tool interactively. So you can see where it's specifying the, the data file. Okay. Um, for those of you have, who are familiar with MATLAB, um, a couple of functions that I like to highlight is text scan to, to read in the data files, uh, data from the um, text file, and also date num for doing the date conversion. Okay. But um, I can the easiest way to make use of this is to simply save it, and then uh, I'll call it import data file. And once I save it, I can immediately use it to reproduce what I've done interactively. Here, uh, the, the file that I saved will now show up in this current folder. And just to uh, test this out, I can go ahead and uh, clear the workspace. Or alternatively, I can just type clear. And it's going to do the same thing. And now I can type import data file into this command window. And it's going to run those sequence of commands that was in that file, that script, and it'll import the five variables that I had in that data file. Now, this command window is is really the the, the main interface to the MATLAB language. This is where you can type MATLAB commands and functions and get immediate feedback. It's a highly interactive environment, and you can think of it really like a, uh, a sandbox where you try out ideas, which is extremely important in the early stages of programming. Okay. Once I have it in, um, one of the components that you might make use of uh, very frequently is the workspace browser. Now, uh, this not only gives you the uh, information on what kind of piece of information that you have available to you, but also gives you some uh, basic statistics, uh, descriptive statistics about the data. So these are all column vectors, and you can look at what the minimum, maximum values mean, median, and so forth. And there are a few other things that you can choose to include, uh, such as variance. Okay. Now, now you can see if you look at this uh, temperature, for instance, uh, we can see that the uh, lowest that it got, the coldest it got, was minus 15 degrees Celsius. Hottest was 38. The range of 53. So you can get some uh, quick uh, view into the data and, and do some uh, quick analysis uh, visually looking through the, the workspace. But oftentimes you might want to use that information in other parts of your program. So uh, rather than looking at this interactive component, you might want to access, uh, have a programmatic way of getting that information. Well, MATLAB is a full language. Uh, MATLAB alone has uh, thousands of built-in functions for design for scientific and engineering tasks. Uh, to, to help you um, use those functionalities 
MATLAB has a very rich documentation as well as tools to really help you find the things that you're trying to do. Um, so from the function browser, you can search for functions or browse for, or for functions. So for instance, mathematics, statistics, descriptive statistics, and you can see uh, here you see the, the functions that apply, um, that correspond to the stats that you saw in the workspace browser. Okay, and if you hover over one of them, you can see a short help text on how to use that function, or click on more help to get a, uh, a full function reference page, which has syntax and description and, and examples that you can uh, copy and paste and then use that to modify for, for your own use. Okay, so, so in our case, um, maybe if I want to uh, programmatically find the minimum value, I can simply say min of the temp, and it'll give you the, the same uh, result that you saw in the workspace browser. Now, what if I wanted to know when that minimum temperature occurred? When was the coldest time uh, throughout the year, during the year? Well, what I need to figure out is where, when this occurs, where in the vector this occurs, and then find the corresponding point for the, from the time variable, okay? Well, if you look at back at the, uh, the the light documentation, we can see that there are other syntax that you can use. So if you ask for the second output, uh, you can say, uh, figure out when, uh, where that occurs. So in the 4987th element of this temperature variable is when this minimum temperature occurs. But now that I have this information, I can figure out when that occurs by indexing into the time vector, and we can see that this is when that occurs. Now, obviously, this doesn't really make uh, sense to me. It's a, a serial date representation, which means something to MATLAB, but it's not really human readable. But if we go back to our, our, our uh, function browser and look for functions that's related to dates, um, you can see that there are a number of conversion functions. So we're going to make use of this date stir, which allows you to convert the date and time information to string format. Okay. So if I go ahead and say uh, time of IDX, we can see that this uh, minus 15 degrees occurred uh, 4th of January 2008 at 2 a.m. All right. Okay. So uh, going back to our problem, we, we see that, um, well, there are some really cold days uh, and um, if you think about where the sensors are located this is located in open air and um, one of the things that people are concerned about in this application is that uh, some of the sensors might f get uh, frozen if the uh, if it's too cold outside and maybe there's some moisture in the air so if it's a frozen sensor the reading that you get out of it is not valid so before we go uh, further with the analysis, we want to first do some uh, data cleaning and uh, do deal with some uh, bad measurements. Okay, so in our case, we have temperature and speed information. So what we can do is uh, we can make some assumptions and say, well, if the temperature is below freezing, it's uh, very likely that the sensor might be frozen. But that alone uh, is not enough. Um, it maybe below freezing, but the sensor might be just fine. So we'll also look at the speed information and say if the speed measurement is uh, close to zero meters per second. So if it's not uh, recording any any uh, speed. So if both of those conditions are met, then we can assume that the sensor might be frozen. Okay, so that's the logic that we're going to use. So how can we do that? Now that's uh, this sort of task where based on the data, finding something that meet a particular criteria. That's very easy to do in MATLAB because of the matrix nature of the language. Um, but let me first use a simple example to illustrate that idea. So I'm just going to create a, a, a test vector, um, random permutation of uh, eight numbers, so in uh, one through eight in random orders. And let's say from this list of numbers, I wanted to identify and automatically pick out all the values that are less than four. So three, one, and two. Well, in MATLAB, what I can do is I can simply ask that question, a less than four. And what that returns is what we call a logical array, logical vector, logical meaning zero or one, zero meaning false, one meaning true. So we can see if we line it up, anywhere you see a one, anywhere it's a true, indeed, these numbers are less than four. Okay, so this comparison did that test for each of these elements and gave me 
true or false. Once I have this, I can actually um, use that to index into another array or or itself in this case. And once and when I do that, it's going to pull out just the values where there are ones. So it pulled out three, one, and two. We're going to do do the same thing. We're going to find all the places where the temperature is uh, freezing, uh, pick it out, uh, figure out all the places where speed is uh, close to zero, and then take it out. And then we can uh, uh, um, deal with those bad bad measurements. Now. Um, just for simplicity, um, for this uh, this webinar, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with uh, the average of these three measurements instead of looking at all three different measurements. And this is just purely just for simplicity in this example. So from these three column vectors, I'm going to first uh, um, create a uh, um, a single matrix that contains all these three. So one, two, and three. I'm just going to uh, concatenate it. So uh, by putting it inside a bracket and separating with a comma, it's going to place uh, them side by side. So now you can see uh, 8776 by 3. So the 3 means that has three columns. Okay, so I created a single uh, matrix. And now what I want to do is I want to average going across. Average these three numbers, get a single number, average these three numbers, and so forth. Do that for all the rows. Okay, well, the uh, the command for that is mean, is the uh, our MATLAB function for uh, calculating the average. So I'll say um, average speed equals the mean of all speeds. But then we can we quickly see that this is not what we want uh, because MATLAB is an interactive environment. You type a command, it'll immediately return the result, and you can use that interactivity to really verify what you're trying to do is indeed correct. So in this case. I, I got a, a result which I didn't expect. I expected a another column vector for each of these rows, but instead I get just three numbers. And that's because uh, of the matrix nature of MATLAB. Many of the functions in MATLAB are really designed to naturally work with uh, matrices uh, and has a default behavior. So for two-dimensional matrix like this, um, it applies this operation uh, by default along the first dimension, which is down the columns. So that's why you see three numbers, which are averages of each of these columns. But if you go ahead and um, take a look at uh, different ways of calling the mean function, you can see that I can optionally provide a dimension, which uh, in this case, if I want to go across the rows, I want to go across the second dimension. And now I get a column vector, and this is exactly what I want. Now, um, from now on, I'm actually going to be start uh, start using a semicolon just to suppress the output. So it's it's nothing different than before, but by using a semicolon, it uh, prevents from displaying the output into the command window. It'll still still do the operation. Okay. So so now that I have this average speed and and temperature, let's try to figure out those icing conditions. Um, for uh, for temperature, I want to find when temperature is less than uh, freezing, uh, but I'm just going to be a little bit conservative and say less than two degrees Celsius. I'm going to say it's it's close to uh, a freezing, approaching freezing temperature. So with that single command, I was able to immediately find zeros and ones where it corresponds to where the temperature is less than two. I can do the same thing for uh, speed, and for this one, for the average speed, I can ask for exactly zero, but these are real measurements. So I may not get exactly zero. So I'm going to, uh, again, do a, something that's a little bit more conservative and say if it's less than one meters per second, I'm going to say it's a uh, very low speed, might be um, uh, stationary, not uh, not sensing anything. OK? So I have two uh, vectors of zeros, and trues and false. And what I want is both of these conditions to be met. So my final is IDX ice temp and IDX ice speed. So this and will do a um, element by element comparison. So if both elements are true, then it will be true. If only one is true or none, then it will be false. All right. So these three commands allow me to quickly identify those icing conditions based on these criteria that I've specified. Okay. Um, 
Uh, I, I, I've been using MATLAB for a while, so it's it's uh, pretty obvious to me that this is doing exactly what I expected. But it's always good when I'm creating these programs is to, to verify that I'm what I intending to do is is what I'm actually getting. So uh, a best way to do that, well, one way is I can open up this variable and then through this variable browser, I can quickly look through and see where I see ones and zeros. But uh, a better way might be to graphically uh, confirm, okay? So visualization is a very common task in, in MATLAB. So we have a dedicated tab for plots. So if we go ahead and say, let's look at uh, a temperature and average speed, and we're gonna plot them as a, uh, a scatter plot, okay? So it may not look make a lot of sense, but we're looking at temperature across the 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 x and then average speed across the y and if i'm what i'm looking for is temperature less than two degrees so something that's um i'm going to use a uh, my annotation to just to uh, draw on the screen but uh something less than two okay so something like here uh for temperature and average speed less than one so something that's probably here okay so i'm essentially looking for something in this lower uh, quadrant lower corner and and um if i did it correctly i i'm um i'm i should be able to successfully just pick out just those points okay so we can verify that graphically by uh let's overlay on top of this the the icing conditions i'm gonna in order to overlay i'm just gonna hold this figure and then i'm gonna say uh, scatter uh temperature of IDX ice and then average speed of IDX ice. So this will pick out just those icing conditions. Um, size, I'll just keep the scatter size the same and then I'll use uh, maybe red, okay? All right, so now we can see, uh, maybe I can zoom in, right? So that the bottom part is where you see the red dots. Okay, so uh, I, I verified that I, I was able to successfully pick out uh, the points that I identified as the icing condition. Okay, so now that I know what the uh, the icing condition is, what I can do is I can try to um, deal with it, and this really depends on the, the analysis that you're trying to um, perform. Uh, for this case, for simplicity, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply remove those icing conditions from my measurements so that uh, it's it's completely out of the data set. Okay, so I'm just going to say average speed of the icing condition and set that to empty, and that's going to remove those points. And now we can see when we look at this that um, now the number of elements is 8762 compared to the full data set had 8776. So 14 uh, icing conditions that we removed from the data set. Okay. So now that we have this, uh, what we can do is uh, we can look at um, perhaps the histogram, okay, because that's one of the quantities that's required to calculate the average power. So here's a histogram that we can use, and and here we go, okay. And notice that as I've been clicking on these uh, plotting commands. In the command window, it's been echoing the, uh, the the equivalent commands. So it's MATLAB is teaching me what these commands are. So if I ever want to do it myself without having to go through these uh, interfaces, I know exactly which commands to use. Okay. Now, histogram, just like with uh, any other MATLAB function, there are default behaviors, such as the number of bins that it chooses to use. Uh, so the default is going to choose 10 different bins. But if I want higher resolution, I can actually specify that, as you can see in this uh, this uh, syntax hint, that I can specify the number of bins or specific bin locations. Uh, um, so I can either specify either of those things. Okay. So let's create a uh, um, a bin that goes from zero meters per second all the way to the maximum of average speed. Okay. And by using this colon shorthand, it creates a uh, um, linearly spaced uh, vector that goes from zero to beginning to the end and uh, increments of one by by the de by default. If I want a different in interval, I can specify a third argument here in the middle. And now 
I'm going to increment by 0 0.5, so 0, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and so forth, all the way to the maximum, which in this case is 21. So now that I have this, I can specify speed bins as the uh, bin locations, and now I have a higher resolution histogram. So by looking at this, we can tell that the majority of the time the window was blowing between 5 and 10 meters per second. Sometimes it was very uh, no wind. Sometimes it was, was as high as 20 meters per second. But now we have a, a pretty good sense of what the distribution of the wind was throughout the whole year. All right. So if we quickly go back to our slides, that's the first half of this uh, equation. We have identified this uh, wind speed uh, distribution. Now we just need to uh, identify this uh, turbine uh, power curve, and then we can, we're on our way to calculate the average power. All right, so up to this point, I've been heavily using the command window because I wasn't entirely sure what the approach was going to be. So I needed this environment that allowed me to interactively try things out. Uh, so command window was the perfect place. I used made use of a lot of the interactive tools like the plots tab and the home tab and, and look, looking at the workspace. But now I'm at a point where I have a pretty good sense of uh, what I the, the direction that I want to go with uh, with this program. So now I want to start to formalize my, my process. So I'm going to do this by starting to create a script of these commands that I've been typing in the command window. Well, I'm going to go to the command history, uh, which has been recording all the commands that I've been typing into the command line or what MATLAB's been typing into the command line. And so it has uh, a commands that goes all the way back to uh, many, many days. Um, and uh, it's a great way of going back and figuring out what you did before and picking out the commands that uh, might be useful. So let's do that. In our case, uh, we uh, imported our data um, and uh, we calculated the average speed. And then we try to identify the uh, icing conditions. Maybe this is where we uh, 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 verify that the icing condition was, uh, was there. Um, remove the icing data points, and then uh, plot a histogram. Okay, so let's say these are uh, the commands that were very useful, and I like to uh, capture them. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a script out of this. So now MATLAB has just picked out those commands that I had highlighted, and then gave me a brand new MATLAB script that has just those commands. Okay, so now I can go ahead and save this. Uh, I'll just give it a name, my analysis. Okay. And once I save that, um, it'll show up here. And now it uh, allows me to run uh, all these commands from start to finish, uh, sort of in a batch fashion. So let me just clear the workspace. I'm going to close all the figures. And, and let's clear the command window. So now I can either hit run here. And run is going to essentially run this my analysis. You can see that it ran through all these uh, 12 lines of MATLAB commands and then ultimately gave me this last plot, which is the histogram. Okay. So now we're really approaching uh, the point that we're starting to create this program that uh, goes all the way from start uh, to uh, at eventually to the, to the end of the analysis. Okay. But as I'm creating these programs, uh, it's, it becomes really important for me to to start annotate annotating so that uh, I have some information regarding what I'm uh, what I'm doing my analysis. So import uh, from text file, uh, uh, calculate average speed, identify icing condition, and then. Uh, histogram, all right? So I can uh, create comments by using this percent sign, and then this is uh, purely for for uh, the reader uh, or, or the user of this MATLAB program to, to explain what's happening for uh, different parts of the program. Uh, I can also break this up into bigger sections by using double percent sign. So this is a data import and prep, okay? Um, Pre-process, so this is, or or let's say data cleaning, and we'll call this part visualization.
Okay, so you can see that as I use these double percent signs, it now logically breaks up my my script into these various sections. And the nice thing about this um, this uh, the section is that now I can run individual sections uh, in isolation. So I have my cursor here in this section. I can click on this run in advance. That's going to import and do the pre um, uh, data prep. Now I click on run in advance. It's going to run these uh, commands to do the data cleaning. Okay, and then we can do uh, uh, some visualizations. All right. So this by by structuring it this way allows you to um, kind of focus your attention to specific sections, and you can iterate and change, make modifications, and and see if it uh, if it's what you're trying to do by by running just that section. It makes it really easy to fine tune the program that you're creating. Okay. Um, let me open up a uh, a completed version of this this uh, example. And you'll quickly notice that it has uh, more annotations, a lot of comments to describe what the problem is. But you'll also recognize some of the similar, uh, some similar commands uh, that we've been looking at. Plot commands. There's some commands for adding labels and titles. Uh, here's where I calculate the the average. Here's where I calculate the icing condition and, and so forth. So um, let's uh, let's actually try to catch up. Uh, by going here and just running section by section, and you'll see some uh, different visualizations that uh, we have in this script. Calculate the average, icing conditions. Um, actually, I'm, I think I'm running a different version of it. So I'm supposed to do this uh, later. So let me bring it back to the wind data version. All right. Uh, all right. Yep, that looks better. Uh, icing conditions, and then here's the histogram. All right, so that was the first half. If you go back to the slides uh, real quick, you can see that um, the next part is to identify this uh, turbine power curve. And the way we do that, the uh, way the power curve is defined is that it's, it's characterized by uh, some parameters. Um, these uh, these velocity locations, the cut-in velocity, the rated velocity, the cutout velocity, but this uh, describes how much power a wind turbine can generate based on how much wind, uh, what the wind velocity is. So obviously, if not enough wind is blowing, it's not going to generate any power. Also, if the wind velocity is too high, it's it's dangerous for the wind turbine, so they actually shut uh, shut down the wind turbine so it doesn't generate any power. There's a, a sweet spot, region three, where it generates the maximum amount at the rated power. And then region two is represented by this equation here that gradually increases based on uh, wind velocity. Okay, so to represent that in MATLAB is pretty straightforward. These are the different uh, parameters, and then we go with the region two first, which is the uh, defined by that equation, as you saw, just as you saw in that the. Uh, the slides, and then the rest of it we make use of logical indexing, what we saw before. If it's below cut-in velocity, cut-in speed, then it's zero. If it's above cut-out speed, uh, then it's also zero. And if it's in that sweet spot, then it's going to be the rated power. Okay, so with that we can go ahead and quickly plot what the turbine power curve looks like for this particular uh, wind turbine. Okay. Once I have this, then it's just uh, calculating that integral, and we're just going to use the the simplest way. Um, since we have data points for each of the bins, we're simply going to multiply the two quantities, the probability distribution and the the, the power curve, and then we're going to sum up all the products. And essentially, we're getting calculating the area under the curve, and that, so that's going to be the the average power. Now, in, in this industry, they they actually represent average power as a fraction of what maximally they can generate, so as a fraction of uh, rated power, and they call this the capacity factor, and then they're going to use that this quantity to identify what's the best location. So in this case, um, we see that um, with the rated power of 1 megawatts, this location can generate average of uh, 270 kilo kilowatts, which has the capacity factor of 27%. Okay, so we can now do this comparison um, with the the other uh, locations. Okay, so so typically um, at this point I've uh, at least 
uh, finished. I'm finished with the analysis, but now what we want to do is uh, uh, we want to apply this to all the other data files. But before we do that, we may want to I'm going to summarize this, maybe print this out, and and make sure that this algorithm, this analysis routine, is uh, exactly what we want. So we might need to share this with other colleagues, uh, see what they think, and see if they see any uh, flags or any changes that we need to make. So obviously, one way to do this is to just uh, print out this script because it's well commented, has all the information, so they can take a look at it. If they want to run it, they can load it into MATLAB and they can hit run. But what we can do is we can take this script that's already uh, well annotated and then publish it. So right next to the editor tab is the publish tab. You click on the publish button and it'll run through the script and then it will generate automatically convert that over to a report um, uh, based on the annotations we have in the script. So all the section headings became the sections within the report. You click on any section, it'll take you to that section with the MATLAB code embedded inside, and any figures that it generates are uh, is uh, embedded inside the report. Okay. If you have any comments within the section, they become text, so there's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship uh, mapping from comments to text. Uh, and then if it has any um, uh, command line outputs, uh, it'll also capture that as well. So this becomes a, a quick way of taking a working MATLAB script and then generating a report that you can easily uh, share with other people. Okay, uh, This publishing uh, capability has additional uh, settings you can change such as the, the output file format where you can output to XML, LaTeX, Doc, uh, Word document, PowerPoint, and, and, and PDF. All right, all right so uh, let me switch back to the slides real quick, and uh, we haven't finished the, the 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 example yet because we need to apply this to multiple files. But let me just summarize what we've done up to this point. So this first half was all about uh, introducing you to the MATLAB language and the interactive programming styles that uh, uh, and the and the functionalities that's uh, surrounded around this interactive programming style. So. All the, the the command window, the workspace, the 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 tool strip with the home tab and the plus tab. All those interactive interactive tools are not just there to to make it easy to use, but there's a, a pathways to generate a MATLAB script out of it. So it's really to help you create a program uh, down the road. Okay, but at some point we migrated over to a script because we wanted to, to formalize the, some of the commands that we were using, and then we started to annotate, add sections, and then once we have it with sections, then we can just publish it and automatically generate a report out of it. All right, so we've been using a lot of different techniques, uh, uh, using the command line, using variables, and, and putting things into scripts, um, and we haven't talked about these, but um, Essentially, we need we may need to start using additional techniques to to really uh, solidify and formalize the, the the functionalities that we're we're developing the our, the programs that we're developing. So the the ultimately what we're trying to do is that we now have a working piece of program. Now we just need to make it better. Uh, we need to make it better because we need to apply this to many files. If we're doing this thousands and thousands of times for different files, we want to make sure that our program is written as efficiently as possible. So we need to make sure that it's it's uh, reusable and general and robust and also maintainable so that in the future, if you need to up, upgrade it, um, it's in a state where we can easily do that. Okay, so let's go back. So uh, one of the um, easiest ways is because we've um, kind of extracted out the file name information. We can go ahead and, and change that name. So if we have another another file here called uh, Tower Location One, I can simply say Tower Location One and then hit publish. And now it's going to do the same analysis, but for a completely different data file. So we're almost at a, already at a state where we can reuse this for different files, but it's a very manual task. I have to go in and manually change the file name. If I have thousands of files, it becomes a very tedious task. So to make this easier, uh, what we can do is we can convert the script to a function 
which has uh, which we can create input arguments where we can input file names and then it'll automatically apply that for whatever file name that I pass in. And then we can do that programmatically by passing in multi a list of file names. Okay. Um, and you can easily convert a script to a function by start, uh, starting with a keyword function. And, um, uh, and we can alternatively have an input. So if I want to say file name as the input to this function, uh, we can do that. Now, uh, if I go ahead and uh, let me just save this to a different file. When we do that, you can see that um, there's some colors that's indicated here. And this is the MATLAB code analyzer that's constantly running in the background. And you may have seen this in, in uh, the previous script that I've been working with. But the, the code analyzer is a great tool to really help you f identify any inefficiencies that you might have in your, in your program uh, or even syntax errors. So uh, you can see here it identified multiple locations. And for this one, it's saying that uh, you have defined file name, but it's, you're not really using it because as soon as I go in, I overwrite it with a, a different file name. So that's easy to fix. I can simply comment this out. And now it knows to use this file name that's passed in. You can see the code analyzer uh, remove the warning. OK, so I can make these type of changes. But um, before I invest uh, any more time on this, one of the things that I want to make sure is that this script is running as efficiently as possible. Um, because I may be running this many, many times. Okay, so uh, in MATLAB, let me just open up the original function again. Uh, there's a tool called the profiler that allows you to really run your program and uh, uh, determine which parts are taking a long time to run. Okay, so in the editor tab, uh, I've been clicking on the run button to, to run scripts, but and also run in advance to go through different sections. But here, there's a, a control called run in time, which allows me to profile my program. So when I do that, uh, you can see that after it ran, it gave me this table of timings of how long it took to run different parts of the code. Uh, so if I drill into the actual script, it'll give you a table uh, that shows which parts of the program has been taking the longest to run. So there is a, a significant amount of time taken to run these five different sections. Date takes, so these are um, actually uh, visualization commands that converts the numerical date representation to textual representation. So it's taking a long time. Importing, uh, understandably, takes a long time because it's reading from disk. Visualization typically takes a, a while. But this gives you a mechanism for identifying those bottlenecks. Okay. And if we scroll down, you can see a color representations of uh, the places that's taking a long time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you can see that there are a lot of hyperlinks. So whenever you see a hyperlink, you can actually dig in to all those individual functions, even if there are MathWorks uh, provided functions. So it really gives you the ability to dig in as deep as possible uh, as it lets you and to determine which parts take taking the longest, and then you might choose to call a function a different way or, or change or find a different function to use uh, instead of the one that's taking a long time. Okay, so really the profiler gives you the ability to really dissect your program and identify those bottlenecks. Now in our case, it turns out that we can deal with many of these issues uh, pretty easily because uh, ultimately what we want with our function is that final average power information or the capacity factor. I don't really care for many of the intermediate graphics that it generates because that was more for the exploratory phase. So I can get rid of all the graphics that's taking a lot of these times. Okay. So if I, um, I already have done that uh, here. So I'm going to compare these two uh, using a file comparison tool that's, that's built into MATLAB desktop. So if I go ahead and say compare selected files, it's going to display those two uh, side by side and gives you a color code indication of the, the differences between the files. So the main difference is that you can see a lot of gaps here. So we remove the plotting routine here. We also remove this plotting. And then we also removed uh, this plotting here. Okay. We did keep the histogram. So histogram is still here, but everything, all the other visualizations I, we removed because it wasn't really necessary for the function version. The other thing is that uh, the, 
the other benefit of a function is that it has this isolated workspace, so it doesn't affect any of the data that's uh, that exists elsewhere. So it's a very controlled way of uh, running commands. But what that means is that if you want to provide share some of the data to the outside world, you have to pass it out as an output argument to the function. Now, in our case, we actually have uh, six pieces of information that we want to share with the outside world. But instead of uh, passing six uh, variables around and having uh, me uh, manage all those six different variables, one of the things I can do is I can combine all of those into a structure. And a structure is a, uh, um, a container data type in MATLAB, which allows you to store different pieces of information inside a single variable. So in this case, when data is a structure, and this is a notation, you can use the dot notation to store additional information, date, temperature, average speed, power, um, capacity factor, and file name, and plug that all the way, all, all of them inside a single variable when data. And that allows me to uh, pass out just the when data variable and makes it easier to manage my, my uh, information. Okay, so with that, um, I can go ahead and simply uh, call uh, when analysis FCN when data txt and it's going to run it for this file. If I go ahead and do this for uh, tower location one, it's going to give you a different result. And you can see the structure is uh, displayed like this with a different uh, piece of data fields uh, displayed uh, like this. We actually did, made one more change, and I'm just going to briefly uh, show this uh, in the comparison tool, uh, which is uh, you can add, make this function a little bit more robust and reusable. Um, we may want to give the the option for whoever's using this. Uh, for instance, if I'm giving this to one of my colleagues, the the option of not providing a file name, but if if they don't, then it's going to uh, display a dialog box which allows them to pick out a file uh, manually. Uh, and then it's going to do some validations to make sure that the file exists. So there's some error checking to make the code uh, function a little bit more robust. Okay, so if you go ahead and say uh, function two, but if I don't passing any file, and then now I'm presented with this dialog, I can go ahead and select the file, and then uh, makes it a little bit easier for people to use. Okay, or if I pass in uh, some file name that doesn't exist. Uh, hello.txt. It's going to say, uh, because there's an error checking, it says file hello.txt cannot be found. So it has a nice uh, mechanism to catch that uh, problem as well. Okay. All right. So ultimately, well, we have a function that's, that can be now applicable to multiple files. And finally, to automate this, um, we have this uh, automation script, which uh, first identifies those files by using the dir uh, command, okay? And what that does is that it uh, figures out what these file names are. So let me just run these three commands here. All right, so and then if we take a look at what uh, files that name looks like, you can see that it was able to automatically pick, uh, pick out the six file names, okay? So this way, I can have a folder with thousands of files. I don't have to manually type anything. I can just let MATLAB determine what those file names are. But once I have them, I can go through each of them one by one using a for loop, uh, a loop. And for each one, I call when analysis function or function two, either way. And then uh, I'll store the result into an array of structures. Then afterwards, I can go ahead and figure out which one had the maximum capacity factor. Okay, so let me just publish this so that you can see what the, the final result looks like. You'll see five different or six different uh, histograms pop up, and then a bar chart, and then a report. Okay, so it automatically processed uh, six files and then determined that the location four was the best location. And this same script can apply if I next day come up with a hundred other data files. I just put them inside this when data files folder. I can run it and now I have a new brand new report with many more data files analyzed, automatically analyzed. All right. Okay, so what we did in that uh, second part was all about making our program 
uh, taking a working program and making it better by uh, making it more maintainable, using better type uh, data types to, to store and organize our information, uh, using functions. Um, we made it uh, a little bit more general so that uh, you can, well, by making it a function, it made it more general so you can pass in fun uh, file names and it'll automatically process those files. We added some validations and error checking. We made it uh, uh, um, a little bit user friendly by providing an option for the user to select a file interactively through a dialog box. Um, we didn't cover it today, but uh, there are other things uh, like using other function types to, to better organize your program. You can make use of packages if people are familiar with uh, uh, things like namespaces in other languages. Uh, there's also a full unit testing framework, uh, which is a framework that allows you to really do a robust testing of your program, and also the various tools that we uh, looked at, like the editor, the deep um, code analyzer, profiler. Uh, we didn't actually get to, to look use a, a debugger, but there's a full debugger uh, in the MATLAB editor where you can step through code one by, line by line and see what's, uh, what's going on uh, within uh, the runtime. In addition, again, uh, we didn't have time to cover it today, but uh, there are other additional programming language features. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, with object-oriented programming, MATLAB also has a full-fledged uh, OO framework uh, where you can define classes and with properties and methods and events, but it's all built around the MATLAB language, so it's uh, everything is matrix-based, uh, so you can have matrix and arrays of objects, uh, but you can uh, create events and listeners, inheritance, and everything that you might expect in a, a full OO uh, language. There's also parallel computing. You can use our parallel computing tools to, to extend what you've done on your desktop to additional hardware resources such as multi-core CPUs, GPUs, or clusters of computers to really scale up and, and uh, deal with large problems, whether it be in terms of speed or, or data size and, and memory. Okay, and finally, um, we always want to think about how we can share our results and package our results to, to share with other people. Uh, we looked at uh, generating reports as one example today, but you can also create user interfaces in MATLAB, such as the one you see on the screen, and package them as a uh, single app so that you can easily distribute them with a single installer file within MATLAB. But also, if you want to uh, share that with someone who doesn't have MATLAB, uh, a license. Then you can also create standalone applications by using the MATLAB compiler or using uh, some of the builder products with the compiler uh, if you want to target specific uh, components like uh, .NET or Java. Um, you can also generate C code uh, from some, some of your MATLAB algorithms uh, by using the MATLAB coder product. So there, these are all different ways that you can share results from, from, from your MATLAB application. All right, so, so in summary, uh, today was all about MATLAB for programming, um, uh, looking at the, the MATLAB language, but it's, it's based on the, the whole matrix-based nature of, of MATLAB, and it's really designed for engineering and scientists, uh, science, but um, allows you to really make use of the full programming language to help you in those engineering and scientific tasks, okay? Um, we looked at some of the interactive development environments, uh, especially in the first half, using the command window and the tool strip and the various interactive tools. But then we uh, uh, slowly moved over to scripts and creating functions and, and other uh, more sophisticated programming tools that are available to you to create large, complex applications. We do have a lot of other resources available on our website. Um, some of the topics we talked about today, we have dedicated webinars on it, such as the Object Oriented Programming or MATLAB for C, C programmers. Um, we also have many examples and, and videos uh, that you can find from our product page. So if you go to our MATLAB product page, you'll be able to find links to videos and code examples. Some of them are included in the product, so if you have the product already installed, you can go to the documentation and get access to them. But if you go to our website, you get um, a, a longer list of uh, some of these examples and videos. And finally, there's MATLAB Central, which is more of a user community. It is a user community where uh, you as the user can 
uh, share information. There's a forum where you can ask questions and do discussions. There's a file exchange where you can upload uh, your code examples or download other people's code examples. Um, a link exchange to, to share uh, links regarding MATLAB and various blogs uh, that talks about different uh, aspects of uh, the MathWorks tool chain. All right, so that concludes this webinar. Thank you.